<laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> okay, I just want to take a minute before we start the meeting that uh, some of the people here will remember Marion and Gord Lapp. They were very active in our branch, even as early as, as soon as uh, what six, eight, six, seven years ago. Yeah. Like that. Marion was one of the regional directors for six years. They both gave quite unstintingly uh, their time. Gord ran the 50-50 draw. <laughs> that was his big job. So it's with sadness we learned that Gord had died back in May. We missed it. And I'd like to thank Joan for bringing it to our attention. And uh, Marion's still in the home. and doing well as far as I can tell. Um, she doesn't get out to meetings anymore, but she's well remembered here. So this is our agenda for the night. Um, we have a few different things here. We're going to do some elections. Uh, we're going to do some of our uh, after break items before break because unfortunately Ruth had uh, to run a, uh, an important errand for her daughter and she phoned Joyce and said she will be here but she'll be late. So we may end up doing the whole meeting before her presentation. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> okay. And of course, we have an anniversary to celebrate. So, uh, welcome to everyone. If there is uh, anyone here who uh, hasn't been here before, there are bathrooms out the ramp door and out through the back. Um, the emergency exits are well marked. And just to note that after 9 o'clock, we do not go out that back door when we leave. We have to go out the ramp door. I, I think it's actually closed off at 8 now, is it, is it not? Yeah. I, I thought it was still 9, but I could be wrong. Because I was not here last month. I was down in Quebec having fun. So, um, at this point, I'd like to ask if there's anyone new here tonight. Oh, good. Uh, what we'd like to ask is if you could stand and give us your name and the surnames you're researching. And it doesn't have to be Durham Region surnames because we, among all of us, are searching just about everywhere in North America and Europe. So. Okay, uh, my name is Gordon Dick. I grew up in the Uxbridge area and lived in Durham Region all my life. I live in Oshawa now. And the, uh, the Dick family, Risebrow, Peg, the Frog, Mackey, Beesby, uh, McCullough, those are the sort of family names. And Great. Well, welcome. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Oh, yes. Sorry. John's holding up the piece of paper at the break, which will actually be our celebration. But you can write down your name and your... Uh, Surnames you're researching, and we do try and put people together if we do notice a, uh, a name in common. Okay. Is there anyone else who's new, or who, even if you're not new, you'd like to get up and remind us of your surnames that you're researching? Or maybe you've got a few new ones since the last time. Okay. So. At this point, I'm going to hand the uh, podium <laughs> over to Steve. He's our past chair and head of the nominations committee, and he will chair our very brief AGM and elections. Well, we thought we'd spring this on you a month early this year, mostly because we have to change venue next month. So just to make sure as many people could make it to a regular location as possible. We have to hold our elections once a year. We have to elect the chair, vice chair, uh, recording secretary, and the treasurer. Those are the four positions that 
OGS requires us to elect. As always, we're always looking for new blood to uh, do any of these jobs. We're only as good as the volunteers that we do have. And many of our volunteers are repeat performers. And uh, some of them probably like a little vacation once in a while. But uh, there are even positions you can work your way up if you want from the bottom and uh, we'll definitely help you as things as we go along so i guess the first position we have to elect tonight would be the chair i guess we'll start with the chair mm -hmm. sounds good the position of chair is open nancy has stated that she is willing to stand should there be no other it <laughs> volunteers. But poor Nancy's on her, this would be her fourth term, I guess? Yep, that would be my fourth term. Fourth term, if, if, uh, if no one else decides to stand. So this is one of the reasons we're trying to, to uh, get some help for everybody. So I'll open up to the floor. Are there any nominations for the position of chair? Going once. Nancy says, please! <laughs> Going twice. Three times. Congratulations, Nancy. <laughs> About another, I've got about another two years in me, and then I'll be <laughs> gone. <laughs> Which is why we're going to go to the vice chair position next. We have not had a vice chair for this year. Normally, the vice chair, after a couple of years in training, would move up to the chair position. So that is at least the idea behind it. So we would like to get a vice chair that would learn the ropes the easy way by not having to commit themselves very much at the start, and then hopefully move up into the chair position in a year or two. So, are there any nominations for the position of vice chair on the floor? Okay. You nominate yourself? You may, you are allowed to indicate you are willing to stand. Yes. Okay. Nick Post uh, has been nominated. <laughs> or however we want to word that. Volunteered. 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 To, uh, for that position. I'll second Nix. Okay. <laughs> and Bob has confirmed that he would, he is quite willing to support Nick. <laughs> I'll, I'll just be loud. <laughs> Are there any other nominations from the floor for the position of vice chair? Going once. Going twice. Three times. Oh, do we have to do it all those in favor or do we just He's acclaimed. He's just okay. Acclaimed. Nick, thank you very much for your There's a, a list for both this long. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Now we move on to the position of recording secretary. Uh, this is currently being done by Karen at the back. Wave Karen if you want. <laughs> uh, and Karen has stated she is willing to continue with the position should no one else be interested. But again, we want to bring in some new blood. So if there is anyone interested and uh, wants to show either for that position or just as a standing position, we will move on. We will. Are there any nominations from the floor for the position of recording secretary? Going once. Going twice. Going three times. Thank you very much, Karen. And now 
now for treasurer. It's a fine job. You have to <laughs> use all the black and red ink. We even supply the pens. <laughs> Sheila at the back as well. Uh, Sheila is also willing to stand for the position of treasurer for this year. Are there any other nominations from the floor for the position of treasurer? Going once, twice, three times. Thank you very much, Sheila. As always, we do need other volunteers. Uh, so if anyone would like to help out in any way possible, just let us know. The members of the executive will, would be glad to talk to you. Maybe all the executive members put up their hands at the moment that are, are here. And if there's a lot of different things out there, even just something as simple as helping with the refreshments. We don't usually have the cake, so it's usually a little easier than that, but uh, we do try to have some drinks and perhaps cookies or something. Although, this new venue we're going to, we may have to stop that. We're, we're still in the process of finding out the rules and regulations for where we're going. So, uh, I guess that would be the end of our elections. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Thank you, Steve, for that brief AGM and elections. <laughs> okay. So as alluded to, starting in November, we do have a new meeting place. Um, Sheila, when she gives her report, will be telling you a bit more about the process of how we chose it. Uh, they are do re doing renovations in this room. Uh, as well as apparently different closing time, they really want everybody out of here much earlier than what we normally are. So from November till June, we have signed a contract and we will be meeting in the Bobby Orr Room at the Civic Recreation Complex. That's at 99 Thornton Road South. It's a very sparse and functional room. I'm sure we will enjoy it. <laughs> Hopefully there's internet connection. If not, we'll have to work around that. And I was told to put a map, map up. I don't know how well you can actually see it. Um, there's our current location up here at the Milwaukee Branch Library. The Civic Rec Complex is over on Thorpe Road south, south of King. So if you're coming from the east or west along 401, <coughs> you'll take Stevenson Road and instead of going to King and turning right, probably the easiest way is to go to Gibbs Street and turn left. It's not very far from here. So hopefully uh, everybody here will uh, Remember to go to the new meeting place in a month. And it will be on our blog. We'll put it on our Facebook group. And uh, it was mentioned in the last newsletter, was it? Yes. So hopefully we'll be captured everybody with, with our notices. <coughs> Bob. One thing it's good to point out, it is an accessible location as well. Good. Glad to hear that. So that will help uh, those of our members who do need the accessibility. So we have been taking registrations over the last two or three weeks, month, a month, uh, for our workshop day, which is Genealogy Beyond the Names. It's October the 14th. It is from about 9 to about 4.30, no, about 4 o'clock, 3.30, 4 o'clock. We have submitted our lunch figures, so if you do join now, unfortunately we cannot offer you lunch, so bring your own lunch. But we st are still accepting registrations. So if you missed the deadline, 
it's still okay. You can still come and listen to our wonderful speakers. These are the lecture topics. We have great speakers. Marion Press uh, is a retired academic librarian. Tammy Tickler Priolo and Janice Nickerson both run their own genealogy businesses. All three of them have given lectures at the OGS conference, and they're all very good lecturers. I'm going to move on to the OGS webinar, which happens on the first Thursday of every month. This month, as in two nights from now, it's Dr. Janet Few, and she's talking about harnessing the Facebook generation. She's talking about getting the younger members of your family interested in family history. Now our next meeting after that is later in November. It's about the 7th, I believe. And the November webinar is on November 2nd. So I have to tell you about it as well. So Catherine Lake Hogan, uh, she's a very good speaker. She's very popular down in the States. She, her specialties are uh, United Empire Loyalists. She's been the Dominion genealogist. And she's going to be talking on From East to West, Ancestral Migration Through Canada. So both of those should be good. And uh, if you don't know how to access the webinars from the OGS website, catch me at some point and I will go over it for you. Now, Ruth was afraid she was going to be really, really late, but she isn't. So I'm going to get her now to come up and give her presentation, and then we'll come back to um, the rest of the society business and stuff after her presentation. Can we suggest that they have five minutes to, while I set up my computer, they can chit chat Definitely. or whatever? Yes. Feel free to network. Okay. the maps up here? Everybody, we're back. We've got the IUV working, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you Ruth Burkholder. A person who's been here many times and always to our betterment. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. I am really glad that you gave me a half hour leeway. <laughs> <laughs> At quarter after seven, no, seven o'clock, I was stuck in traffic in downtown Toronto. <laughs> I came straight out Kingston, Eastern Avenue to Kingston Road and just kept right on coming. I've never seen so many buses in all my life <laughs> stopped in front of me and not moving. <laughs> all marked, not in service. They didn't care how long they took. Anyway, I was so glad when we finally ended up on 401 and I got and couldn't speed up. <laughs> and I got time to be able to talk to you and I'm so pleased. You know, Joyce asked me to talk about land records in Western Canada. And I'll be honest, I don't have a clue. <laughs> and absolutely no idea. And then I thought, Western Canada? What is Western Canada? And I thought I knew until I looked at your webpage that said I was talking about Prairie Provinces. Uh uh. Western Canada goes to the ocean, does it not? <laughs> so, we're going to talk about land records in Western Canada. Everything west of Ontario. <sighs> At least a smattering of them. Because I'm not really positive what I'm talking about, but I thought Library Canada, Library Archives Canada might be. And there's a few other places that might know what they're talking about. So I went looking and put something together to tell you. Mainly what I'm going to tell you probably is websites. So that you can see, because I really don't know what it is you were wanting. But <coughs> Library Archives Canada 
has a web page. And if you look carefully, is there a, a, a pointy top? Out one? Yeah, the top one. Um, okay. If you look carefully at the very top, you'll see home, discover our collection, land records. And there's all sorts of land records mentioned on this page. I think maybe what I'll do is this. I've got a neighbor too. <laughs> um, they talk about databases, digitized microfarms, provincial and territorial land records, and land grants to veterans, but one of the databases is land grants of Western Canada. Ooh, that sounded interesting. I, I would suggest that you go to Library Archives Canada and read the whole page on land records. Because there's all sorts of bits and pieces on there. And there are all sorts of um, different things that you might find if you had people who moved from the east to the west, and I'm not trying to overtake her presentation, which you just announced. Yes. <laughs> um, but there's all sorts of different ways people got land in the west. So, land grants of western Canada. 1870 to 1930. That covers the Hey, you could cover your parents, right? I know my parents were quite able to have gotten land within that time frame. And again, there's databases and all sorts of bits and pieces. So, I've given you a map because the land system in uh, Western Canada is based on a unique checkerboard survey developed specifically for the prairies by the Canadian government. It covers over 200 million acres. The world's largest survey grid laid down in a single integrated system. And there were more than 1.25 million homesteads coming out of that survey. So I want you to look at the map because you have to have an idea of how it was parceled so it could be granted to settlers. It's okay, I got it here. Oh, it's on screen. Thank you. <laughs> yes, but I wanted you to have it so that when, when we look at it, late, when I talk later, you still got it in front of you. Because it will disappear from the screen. We're going to talk land speak. We're going to learn land speak. In Ontario, we talk of counties, townships, concessions, and lots. And they have both numbers and names. Well, Western land speak talks of meridians, ranges, townships, and sections, and they're all numbers. There's not a name in sight. In 1871, an ordering council initiated a uniform land survey of the three prairie provinces, as well as the railway belt of British Columbia. This land had to be accurately described and located through cadastral surveys before land patents could be issued to a homestead. Get to the next page here. The Dominion Lands Act required that each homesteader provide proof that the land had increased in value through additions, additions like cultivation, building construction, and so on, costing labor and or capital. The Dominion Lands Act also stipulated the improvements that had to be made to a land grant before a homesteader could receive a letter's patent from the Crown. The homesteader filed an application and the local Dominion Lands Office screened and validated the claim and sent an inspector to the property to confirm that the improvements had really been made. If the board approved the application, it went to Ottawa for the preparation and issuance of patents by the Land Patents Grant. <coughs> land letter 
Grant's patent were issued to a grant or to confirm title to a portion of land. They were the first title to land and served as proof that the land no longer belonged to the Crown. They were issued by the Register General's Office of the Department of Secretary of State from 1867 to 1883. And after the 18th of July, 1883, the land patent branch of the Department of the Interior did the issue. Okay, take a look at the map and follow along. The federal surveyors established seven meridians, and those are the red lines, which act as baselines for surveying and numbering the townships. The first, or principal, or prime meridian was established, now they started, they went across the, the border, the U.S. border, and they established the first one, the prime meridian was near Emerson, Manitoba at a longitude of 97 degrees, 27, <laughs> I don't know, inches and 28 feet, or 27 feet and 28 inches west of Greenwich. So they had their little theodolite or something, and they went out there and they found where this was, and they said, okay, straight up from here to the North Pole, but I don't know if they knew about the North Pole, this is going to be the prime meridian. The second meridian is on the 102nd longitude, near the present day Manitoba, Saskatchewan border. The third meridian is at the 106th longitude in Saskatchewan. The fourth is at the 110th, the Alberta, Saskatchewan border. The fifth one falls at 114 in Alberta. The sixth at 118 in Alberta, and the Coast Meridian in 100, at 122. Okay. Ranges got numbered from east to west from each meridian. Uh, except for the west to east numbering when, where they had that bit in Manitoba that went the other way. <laughs> yeah, this is why you've got the map in front of you. Do you understand now? <laughs> And so there they had east of the prime meridian and west of the prime meridian. And then when you get over to that coast meridian, that little bit in British Columbia, you see how there's some up and some down below? Again, you've got east and west of the coast meridian. The ranges were numbered 1 to 34. So. Between each of those meridian lines, there were 34 ranges, and they went all the way up. Okay. Then they had townships, and they're numbered from south to north. Starting at the U.S. border, they number from 1 to 129, and also there's 141 there somewhere. And then they had sections because they divided, the sections were divided into four quarters or 16 legal subdivisions. They're numbered from 1 to 36. Each section was approximately a square mile or 640 acres divided into quarters. So if a man said he had a quarter section, he had 160 acres. Are you all as confused as I was? <laughs> You asked for it. <laughs> and so, what we've got here is a diagram of a section. No, I'm sorry, of a township. Which shows how, you can see how the sections start at the bottom, and they don't even go east to west. <laughs> They go east to west and then around back west to east and then east to west and then around back west to east. So you can't count that you've got six sections. So you can't count that, that section 12 will be above number 6. Because it's not. It's above number 1. Now you know why I said I didn't know too much about this. Okay. 
shows that there were specific, you can see in, in there, four specific things with writing in them. Two of them have Hudson Bay Company lands in it, and one has railway lands, and the other has school lands. So they, so within each section you had space for two Hudson Bay lands, and they're, they're the diagonal, this thing on the it was on there for a minute. <laughs> I know, but it, it was there. There it is. <laughs> there's one Hudson Bay and there's the other one. This is a railway land and that's a school land. So then in each section, you've got a school. Okay. Railway land, Hudson, okay. Homestead lands were every even numbered section except 8 and 26. <laughs> because 8 and 26 were the ones that went to the Hudson Bay Company. They got section 8, three quarters of section 26, and all of 26 in every fifth township. <laughs> Railway lands are the odd numbered sections except for 11 and 29, and they were school lands. Okay. Having figured all this out, or not figured it out, so this is what I've just told you. You can read it for yourself. And you can also find it on Library Archives Canada website. So what kind of records can we find to go with this new land speak? Okay, uh, you can be sure there'll be new words in that too. Letters patent, we would call them land grants, are found in two record groups at the Libraries of Archives Canada. So, the records. Letters patent, two record groups. Office of the Register General of Canada, Department of the Secretary of State, 1880, sorry, 1870 to 1883. Some levers between 11 and 105 and the microfilm Okay, Land Patents Branch, Department of the Interior from 83 to 1930. It also includes a number of small grants between the years of 31 to 50. The grants usually consist of one page document with the name of the grantee, the description of the homestead, and the date the land was granted. Tells you a great deal probably what you need to know. The name of the person who got it, where it was, and when he got it. They were pretty sparse with their documentation. Well, the database contains over 670,000 references to letters patent for Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and the railway belt of British Columbia. Now you see why I had to include British Columbia in this Western land grant stuff? So your search results will be displayed as a list showing the names and locations of each item. And then if there's anything else, when you click on the number, the record number, you'll see it. So I got curious. I tried looking at Burkholder. I figured, I don't know why British Columbia is there. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, I don't know. Looks like we jumped, or we lost something. But when I looked at British Columbia, I noticed, no, when I looked at Burkholder, I noticed there were 13 results. Two of them seemed to be almost identical, so I took a closer look at both. And what was interesting is where the grants were recorded. They were in two different books, quite some of them near distance apart, but the papers within reasons for the two entries don't appear to be online. But what I did notice was that it was for the same piece of property. It was husband and wife. He got a portion, she got a portion. Who knows? They don't tell you why they decided to grant it. They just tell you they did it. The 
what they said is that there is a possibility that the films are digitized. So get in touch with the Library Archives Canada and find out. Or else, latch on to your, your favorite person in Ottawa and ask them to go find it for you. <laughs> so, I also, let me go back one here. I also noticed that there was a place that said provincial records. Because I thought, okay, Library Archives Canada has this. What do the provinces have? We don't find too much about Ontario in Library Archives Canada. There's some, but there's far more at the provincial archives. What, what's happening in the provinces? So I decided to start in the West and come East. In British Columbia, under the heading Genealogy and Family History, there's the title Places. And it's a list of the provinces. So I went, on, went to there and I got British Columbia, scrolled down to land, saw land grants of Western Canada database and the BC archives. So I went to see what the archives might have about land. This is the BC archives web page. Quite a pretty page with a nice boat on it. And you can see the highlighted one is about the BC archives. But I went and I found where they talked about land. And uh, here they had a variety of things. The page is so plain, so the font is so pale, even on the website that it is obviously not coming up well on your screen. All the more reason for you to go to the website. So they had a variety of places that they listed that they had land records for. And I chose Yale out of it, mainly because it only had four records. <laughs> I thought that might be easy. And so, where am I? Let me see if I can find the right page here so I can tell you what's on it, because I can't even read it on the computer. <laughs> Unless somebody can read it from the, their seats, which I have my doubts. First one's Dominion Regulations. Yeah. And then there's the land settlement records for the Railway Belt and Peace River Block, and preemption applications, and records of the government office in Fairview, B.C. Well, we're talking about land, so guess which one I picked? I went and picked... Okay, where's my... <laughs> Sorry, guys. I picked the one that said land. And that was it. There was nothing more. There was absolutely nothing more online. So, I guess you've got to go to the archives, or again, get your friendly genealogist in Victoria to go find out what might be there. So, I went to Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm supposed to tell you all about the light western, so let's see what Alberta has to show And it's archives. And they have homestead records with an online guide to finding more information. Sorry. Because look where it comes from. It does <laughs> not come from the archives. <laughs> the people at the Alberta Genealogical Society went to the archives and did the indexing and put it on their own site. But it is linked from the archive site, so you can find it there. Well, so there was something that said search. I think it is that brown arrow. So I searched with Burke Holder. And I got a number of entries that looked like this. And again, it didn't tell me very much. So again, you have to go to the archives 
or go somewhere to find out what they were indexing. Get somebody out there to do it for you. So, I was very frustrated there, so I thought, okay, let's try Saskatchewan. <laughs> the Saskatchewan archives. We look at what their archives tells us about land records, and a number of interesting entries. But again, I decided to go look for a database, and there was one there in the middle. So, I can search by name, or I can search by location. Didn't have a clue on the location, so I put in Burkholder, got eight results, and learned that you have to go to the Saskatchewan <laughs> office, or contact the Saskatchewan office to get anything further. <laughs> so I played around a little bit, and came up with ISC Saskatchewan. It is a government website, and it lets you look at a lot of Saskatchewan records, but you have to set up a free account to do so. And in the land title section, you can search for a land grant and get a copy of a document with a seal on it. So, I then, that was great. Then I moved on to Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I could find nothing that used the four letters together that say L-A-N-D. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. You can find it in the Western Land Grants, but there was nothing at the Manitoba Archives page. <laughs> no. I mean, you can. Okay, when we do searching, I don't know about you, but me, I like to look at everywhere I possibly can to find out every smidgen I possibly can. So, yes, I would start with the Western Land Grants, but then I thought if she was in Manitoba, I'd go to Manitoba and see what might be there. Is there anything more? I'm just mentioning because there's about four documents here on on access to my sister of the land grant. It's the land grant location. It's the application. That comes from the Western Land Grant mm -hmm. stuff from Library Archives Canada. At least the audience to know that it is available. Right, but as I say, from Manitoba Archives, you'll get nothing. So, the one thing I really discovered as I was looking at these, if you want anything more than the land grant, or your people went out and bought land instead of getting a grant, the people did. I found that the difference between Ontario and the West was that an individual would find it very difficult to, to get uh, extra information. Take a look at these. There's a map of Manitoba, by the way. And you know, look at your map. What I found most interesting, the way I looked at this map, was where the land, the lines went. Look at where the, the, second, the second meridian goes. A chunk of, of Saskatchewan is with Manitoba. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and it's something for us to think about when you go looking <coughs> and, and seeing these, that while most of Saskatchewan is in the second meridian west, or the third meridian west, there is a smidge that's in the first. So, that's what basically this shows us. If you look for land registry in Manitoba, there are six title offices. You need the legal description, the title registration, the civic address, and the current owner to do a title search back. And if you've got the right information, you can do it. Good luck. I uh, care because Western land speak does not tell you where the towns are. You got to go figure that one out. 
before you start. Because if you know that your sister went and bought land at whatever town, you've got to figure out where it is on that grid to be able to come up with the right location. So, Saskatchewan has eight customer service centers. And again, you need the legal description, the parcel identifier number, the current registration, and the current registered owner, and they only deal with registry agents. When you, go, if you have to be a registry agent to go to the record office. Alberta only has two registry offices, one in Calgary, one in Edmonton. Historic records aren't computerized. And again, you need the legal description and the title registration number for a search. There is an address, an email at, not an email, a website on the bottom here, titlesearchers.ca registries, which is where I got this bit of information for each of the provinces. This one came from Alberta, but it had the most space to be able to put one on. And in BC, you've got three land title offices and seven land title districts. So each of those three offices deals with more than one district. Historic records are not computerized or online. And again, you need a legal description and a current registration for a title search. So where does this leave us? So even if you know the great grandpa settled in a certain place, to find anything more, you have to have far more information than I've got for any of those work holders I found in the Western land grants. Now, there are some other places that you should know about. One of them is the Glenbow Museum. The Glenbow Museum has lots of things in it. But one of the things it has is the archival collection of the CPR land sale records. Do you remember each of those sections had railway lands? The CPR had the right to sell those lands to homesteaders. So I searched for Burkholder again, and I found two records. And um, I had put in a second piece on a slide, and it, they're not coming up to show you these things. The other thing I'm going to suggest is that you get in touch with the local genealogy societies. As with anything else, I don't care what you're searching. I don't care who you are. You people know far more about what happened in old Ontario County or in current Durham region than anybody else. Because you're working with it all the time. You're out there transcribing cemeteries. You're transcribing census. You're dealing with this. It's the same everywhere. The local people who are into doing genealogy are much more likely to be able to tell you where and how and what this means than anyone else. I was looking for somebody in Alberta once, and I got the, the land, land speak description of where they were. So I went to um, one of those Roots Web message boards where, and I, I looked up Alberta, and I put into it. I've got this description, can somebody tell me the closest town? And I got four answers almost before I clicked send. <laughs> because people who were reading the board knew, local people knew the answers. Yes, ma'am. You know, I was just talking about the The source for her information should be found in the I haven't quite finished yet. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> Thank you. All 
also, once you've done with local genealogy societies, yes, ancestry and family search, both have been putting stuff online. They have been microfilming them. But they are not complete. As with many things, it sometimes takes a while to get the complete package online. So you will find things in um, Ancestry. You'll find things in Family Search. And I hope you do. Because that, again, can give you the basic. What you're going to find there are probably the Western Land Grant applications. Um, you may find a little more than you would get off Library Archives Canada because they've been in filming there. Um, and you said that was Manitoba and Saskatchewan? No, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, and it's the Homestead Grand Register. It's 1872 to 1930. Yeah, well, that's what we first talked about, the Western Land Grants. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it actually looks good about this one that I mentioned. It's got the Homestead number, location, the meridian, everything. Yes. Yes, but does it, it doesn't tell you what town it's near, and that's where you have to go. Actually, it does. Does it? What does it say? Yeah. Give me a second. I've got problems with I'm the connection to my just a second because it's like Hollywood and Saskatchewan. And where did that come from? This, the record came from Massachusetts. No. Oh. Where did the place come from? Was it listed on one of those pages? Oh, I see what you said. The place is in Saskatchewan, Canada. Then when you open up, open up an image, the location for where he was given the land is, is mentioned there. It, it, and it is only in land speak or has actually got a town? Give me a second and we'll go down the line. It's just like you told me your fenced up and it should be right. Oh. I'm just waiting for it. Listen, my whole day's been strange. I'm not surprised. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not saying you didn't. But I'm, I don't know that it was actually in... It might have been on an envelope when they mailed it to him. Mm -hmm. If the envelope it's is shown right, there... It's said right in the document. Okay. Before, when you were talking, it's just so I understand it. It actually said... Okay, because face it, a lot of those land grants were given before towns were created. So you may or may not, depending on the date. It was the same when, when, when they issued patents here in Ontario. You got the township because the townships were named, but you didn't get the name of the town they were near because the towns hadn't been created yet. So sometimes we have to look at things and also look at the era that we are searching and figure out what might be there and what might not be there. Or what you might be able to find now that you couldn't find out of the original. So, I, here are the genealogy society branches. Manitoba has four. Saskatchewan has 15. Alberta has well, Alberta is interesting. Alberta has the Alberta Genealogical Society and the Alberta Family History Society. <laughs> There's 10 branches of the Alberta Genealogical Society and the Alberta Family History Society, I believe, is located in Edmonton. And then British Columbia has one society for the whole province with a number of, with a number of branches. But the website didn't tell me how many branches, so I can't put it there. So, I have a handout up here 
with some of the links of the places I went to, with some of the writing from Library Archives Canada, which is why, by the way, Dan, I think you said something about putting it on the website. Because I had lifted it from Library Archives Canada, <laughs> I'm not sure that you really want to <laughs> put it on your website. You put a link. <laughs> but what I have done is put on the end of the handout um, my email address, and I will email it to you if you want live links, or if they're going to put the live links up on the website, either way. But I hope you have enjoyed learning a little bit more about the history of our great country in this 150th anniversary year. Yes. Uh, one of the things that uh, that we do here in Ontario, we're trying to find out where a piece of land is. is uh, sometimes we look at those old county atlases. Do you know whether they have such things out in west? No, I was reading David Obie's page on western lands, yes. and he suggested looking at um, directories. <laughs> that there are there are apparently a number of directories for the Western provinces, which tell you where somebody is in Western land speak. <laughs> I'm just, just going to add, I think there's a lot of township books for the locations out west as well. They're well worth looking at. Yeah, they, they have done a lot of, um, I guess they're township histories. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, the west seems to be really taken with creating histories of all the people who lived in a, an area. Sometimes they're called by names and you have to figure out which township your people were in to know which book to look at or read indexes or, but that's a good point, Steve. Any other comment? Is, is there anything in the, you know, the Our Roots website that they have any books of maps or things like that? Probably. Mm. And again, it's one of those, I did not search that one. Mm. Because... Um, it's hard to search for maps. Yes. <laughs> but that's where if you knew the, the name of a location, you could search our roots. I always think of it with the French name. Mm. <laughs> no, I see. No, I see. Yeah. Um, to uh, get the name of the book that goes with that township. If you know where, you know, if you figured out where they were. Or sometimes you can put a person's name in and then it will come up with the names of, of books. Well, what made me think of it is I noticed that a lot of the content of that, it seems to be for, start in, from Western Canada. Yes. So. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, it's one of the Western universities that put it up. Yeah. <laughs> so it makes sense that it's Western Canada if they're doing their libraries. Yes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's a good idea to find out where they lived and join one of the genealogical societies out of the West. Sure. Like if I joined one in Manitoba because that's where the crowd is. Yeah. It certainly would. Both in, again, because they do the same as you do, put, put information about their area online, and sometimes have members only pages, you know. And they'll have publications. You can get cemetery transcriptions or census transcriptions, that sort of thing. Branches. And don't forget, find a grave. Yeah. Find a grave can lead you to many places. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Any other questions for Ruth? Oh, yes. Yeah, I just want, uh, when, when some of my family went out in 1875, um, but I don't really know why. Was there land for free out there? Or did they have to... Um, well, that depends. I was looking at... Um, I actually had Glenn Wright do some research for me on somebody who went out to the Louis Rebellion. And they got land in the West because they were a veteran of the Rebellion. Which side? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the side, of course. They went from Ontario. <laughs> okay. 
so, so what I'm saying is, this is why when I was talking to Karen, that I said, we look at everything we can possibly think of. But I only got that land, the, the, I, the fact that he got Western land, because I had Glenn Wright go to the Li Library Archives Canada and look it up for me. And? Well, you mentioned find a grave. If you find uh, one of your ancestors in the find a grave cemetery, um, does it, will it give the description of where the cemetery is in your land speak? Maybe. That depends who put it up there. Yeah. You know, if somebody put, if somebody put the description of where the cemetery is, then that, it'll be there. The Saskatchewan Genealogical Society is really superior. And if you go in, you can certainly find the burial sites of your relatives and the details. Not yes. just an index, but dates and dates yeah. and facts. Joan is just commenting that the Saskatchewan Genealogical Society does a good job at giving you great information on people from their cemetery websites. Janice, did you have something? I don't have a question. I just um, always have an awful time understanding the meridians, the ranges, the townships. And, and thank you for this map. It's very helpful. Well, I particularly sent it over here because I cannot print in color. And it made much more sense in color yeah. than in grades. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, Ruth, again, you've given us a very good overview of the topic. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> okay, B is not here. Okay, that was quick. <laughs> Sheila has a report for us. Okay, just to start, I'll uh, go over the account. Um, the withdrawals for September were $662.50. The deposits uh, were $310.18. So the balance of our current account is $4,943.84. So um, I just wanted to uh, talk about uh, why we're moving to the Bobby Orr Room for our uh, next uh, meeting and then from November to the following June. So the Oshawa Public Library here, this room is going to be renovated and then uh, when, when it's completed the renovations, they will be closing at nine o'clock. So, we usually had the room until 10 o'clock, so that's why we made a decision to uh, try and find a new location. So I contacted 25 facilities in Oshawa, including uh, local clubhouses, the North and South Legion, Legends, other community centers, churches, the Whitby Public Library, and a lot of locations were already booked for the first Tuesday of the month. Uh, some had no Wi-Fi, some were quite expensive, uh, a couple not accessible. So um, Nancy uh, made a decision because we had decided uh, at our last executive meeting that this was something that needed to be done. We decided to book the body work. Um, now, being there, uh, we're required to reapply every year. Uh, it's not like when we were at the library, we would just continue year to year. Um, so next March or April, we'll have to uh, fill in an application and apply again for the following September to June. So we have time from November to that March period to decide if, if it's working for us. Um, now, also, because we're even though we're in the city, but anyways, uh, 
being at the city property, uh, we, are, we were, are going to require a license for the 50-50 draw. So I received all the information from the city of Oshawa, and we're going to discuss that at our uh, next executive meeting because it requires a lot of work, paperwork, uh, fees, uh, a trust account needs to be set up, so I don't know whether it's all and for our cookies and water and drinks, we would have to pay a $30 charge every meeting uh, just to sell <laughs> water. So, um, Bring your own. <laughs> well, we could do that, or if we do supply it, um, we always have a donation box at the table. So we can decide, I guess, how we want to do that. Okay, and I also have a map at the back if anybody needs uh, an extra look to see where the meeting's going to be. It's probably a good idea to wander over there and scout it out before the next meeting. Is that going to be on the website too? Uh, map? Yeah, once we get back into the website. Oh. They have a problem right now in the OGS is changing platforms and doing stuff and Dan hasn't been able to get on and change our website for two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> so don't count on it. We will try and do it with the uh, blog and the Facebook group instead. Okay? So our upcoming meetings at the new location. Um, November we've got Share the Twos and Bob Bell doing the Churches of Dura Region. Uh, December is the uh, Christmas special, bring and brag and potluck treats, not potluck dinner, potluck treats. And in January we're going to do our usual brick wall panel, so start looking at your stuff, identify <coughs> any brick walls that you want us to make suggestions on. It's even better if you can send them in to the branch, web, uh, branch email address and that gives Steve and Deb a chance to have an extra hard look at it before we discuss it at the meeting. But if you can't manage to do that, just bring the information along with you and we'll just bounce ideas around until we make as many suggestions as we can that will help you hopefully break down the brick walls. The DNA Special Interest Group meeting is October 18th at the office. Uh, we don't have a particular talk, talk picked out at this point in time. <coughs> check, the webs, uh, check the Facebook group and the blog. If we do come up with an actual title, you'll see it there. And just briefly, um, I've been asked recently about basic family history courses and um, I haven't found one in Durham Region. We actually have uh, been approached by any of the libraries to give one, uh, but the Toronto branch is hosting one uh, on basic genealogy and family history. Starting tonight, so you miss the first day, but uh, you can certainly sign up for the other six sessions. And genetic genealogy, you can to our group, or you can take a three session course with the Toronto branch. I believe they're holding all those courses down at the Toronto Reference Library at Young and Poor. See, we, we gave you lots of time, Ruth, but you came in sooner than we expected. <coughs> so at this point, I'm going to do one thing. Uh, Deb? Excuse me. Um, when you mentioned about us being here in the library in November, Oh, um, mm -hmm. refresh yeah, the details. November, 4th. November the 4th. 4th? Okay. That's right. The library's having their Heritage Day, and we have said we will take a table. I will be manning it. Sheila's offered to help. I don't know if uh, Deb is available. Um, we're not going to be down here, which they've done the last, I don't know how many years. They're actually going to have us up in renovated areas on the main level of the library. And I believe they, they will have just dedicated a new local history room, I believe. 
So it could be very interesting. So it's on out November the 4th, and yes, you're right, that's before our next meeting, so uh, I better get it up on the blog and the uh, Facebook group as well. So when we were at a conference this year, they do the celebrations of all the special anniversaries, and um, we got our 35-year certificate. Steve took uh, care of uh, getting it framed for us, and it will join the other five-year uh, milestones that we've got up on the wall in our office. So I think since Steve takes care of the office, I think he should come up and accept this. <laughs>
And we would make close to $500 yeah. each time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we did the Columbus Yard sale too. Yes. 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 After that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had a quilt raffle yeah. at one time. Cookbook? Cook oh, yeah. Yes. yes. Cookbook. <laughs> I was on the cookbook committee. Yes. Had the conference twice. We've hosted the conference twice, 2005, 2006, and 2013 at the provincial conference. Yes. Some cemetery transcriptions. Oh, yeah, one of the cemetery <laughs> transcriptions along the way. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember uh, doing the Quaker one in Pickering Village with a baby on a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> As I was doing it a long time ago. Church records? Church records I never got involved in. Um, Bessie did mostly. Bessie and Katie were good. Bessie and, yeah. and um, yeah. I, I did Thorns with, with Katie. And the lady from Newcastle. And Dorothy Brown. Dorothy also. Brown. Dorothy Brown, yes. yes. There's another name. Uh, two schools. A lot of people over 35 years. We were just. You know, toddlers, <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Okay, so grab a drink at the back, and we will cut the cake at the front here. And, and uh, the punch doesn't have added sugar in it. It's just fruit. Straight so. fruit punch, no added sugar. That's right. Okay. Or other ingredients. <laughs> well, it, it has some fizzy stuff in it, but it, it's not sugar. Okay. <laughs> Before we all break up, we have a new executive just come to the front and <coughs> uh, are reminding me. Yeah. The, the new the new executive. The new old executive. The new old exe well, yeah. Yeah. we have one person. One we have one new person. This, yeah. this is good. So you're only on the card. Well, we can do that after the cake. So okay. Okay. okay, okay, we can do that. We'll do it after the cake. Why don't you stand with the cake? Why don't you with the cake? Okay, come on up, everybody, and don't trip on wires. Well, just the whole council. Yeah, the whole council. Somebody from Virginia. Wow. <laughs> now, you know, my father always used to say, 
who would like the first cut? <laughs> but we had a piece of pie, we had a pie on the table. And he would cut it like this. <laughs> and he would take the plate and he would say, here. <laughs>